I was always a bitch. A lot of people years ago would call me bitter. Call yeah. me a dude. I don't care. I once punched someone in their ass and felt their like lower colon. Hey, I'm Ariel Demure. Hi, I'm Maddie Collins. Hey guys, I'm Maya Wolf. Hi, I'm Little Puck. I'm Bree Mills. And you're listening to the Adult Time Podcast. Ariel, Miss Demure. Bonjour. Bonjour. Ça va? <laughs> Bien. Oh, okay. And that's where my friend said, <laughs> welcome to the Adult Time Podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. It's been a long time. I know. Too long. Well, I'm trying to think of when the last time we would have been on set together. I want to say that was, ooh, it would have been almost two years ago. Oh, man. I think. Yeah. Goes to show. Yeah. It, on my end. You that, stay busy. Yeah. I, I, I say, well, I guess we both stay busy, yeah. right? Better busy than bored. Yeah, That's what exactly. I say. So what have you been up to lately? This and that. Yeah. Trying to stay busy, yeah. honestly. Finally getting back into travel. Um, the past couple of months, I've actually been focusing on my mental health which is really important, yep. not only for adult entertainers, especially adult entertainers, but everybody, not enough focus on it in this world. Yep. So been really trying to hone in on how to be the best version of myself outside of work. Which is, to... which is interesting. I, I, I struggle through very much the same where it's like, I, a struggle is maybe not the right word. Right word would be like, focus on that. Right? Yeah. Because if you don't, especially in today's day and age and in the work that we do, if you don't focus on carving that balance mm -hmm. between person, persona, you and get lost. you get lost. Yeah. yeah 100%. It really sucks to experience burnout because it's not only influencing you. We've put ourselves out there so much so mm -hmm. that so many people like become really attached to us. And when we allow ourselves to be burnt out, then it's not just, you know, like your little fan base, it affects entire companies at some po point, you know? So it is really important to focus on that. And I've been doing it and things are going really awesome. I'm so excited. what, what are some of, what are some of the like tips and tricks that you've picked up that work for you, for you? You got to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. That was something that I really struggled with is I'm a very independent person. I'm very self-reliant. I don't like asking for help if I don't think I need it. And um, figuring out how to actually talk to a professional in order to suss out what the hell is going on, you know, has been really life changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, my family, we go back years and years with mental health struggles and, you know, first starting, you know, talking with my mom, like, mm -hmm. okay, what are you doing? And then going from there, it was really helpful. Yeah. And I'm very fortunate to have a strong support system with my family. My mom and dad are not necessarily fans, but they are supporters <laughs> yeah. of what I do. They're yeah. proud of me. Well, it's, uh, it, you know, the, I think the more people too are open about the importance of things like therapy and having support systems in place, mm -hmm. the more we can destigmatize the, just that aspect of preventative care. Absolutely. Yeah, so like, much of this world would be such a better place if people were just communicating with one another. On yeah. A, this is where I'm at. Yeah. What can we do? And as somebody who isn't in, who isn't you and isn't in your circle, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody who is going to be objective, is going to ask you challenging questions. And I mean, I, I have definitely uh, worked with therapists throughout my life at different points in life. And it usually was the thing I needed or the resource I needed to come to whatever turning point I mm -hmm. needed to come to myself, but with that support. So Absolutely. kudos to you and thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And you touched on something that's so important. You need to have an unbiased opinion. So when I was finding a, a psychiatrist and a therapist that was going to work for me, I didn't want a yes man. Mm -hmm. I didn't want someone who was going to over psychoanalyze what I was doing and justify my behavior. Mm -hmm. I wanted a mirror to be held up and I wanted to be told, this is where you fucked up. You need to work on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just because you're having a bad day doesn't mean you can blame your disorders or you can blame your chemical imbalances. We all have shit that's going on that doesn't give you an excuse to be an asshole. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, and it, it's, it's for me, like one of the things that I've really been working on the last few years is like sort of that, um, fight or flight response that yeah. everybody has, yeah. but that comes out from 
being so immersed in the sort of digital world, right? Mm -hmm. So you pick up your phone and it's like picking up this landmine of like, oh shit, did this person say about, yeah. me, or did I say this wrong? Or like all those anxiety triggers yeah. and learning, you know, I kind of have this almost kind of kumbaya moment with myself every day where I, I look at that and if I feel the flare up, mm -hmm. I say to myself, it is not real. I'm going to put it down. You, you know, the one person's opinion is not the world's opinion. Absolutely. And I've actually found that I've been able to let go of so much stress. Yeah. So much. 100%. And I'm just like, I am not going to like the idea that anxiety is mostly self-imposed adrenaline based on something you're making up. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You create these neural pathways in your brain. They trigger the chemicals to be released. And then it's not real. It's not reality. It's no. not actually happening. It's all chemical and being yeah. able to tap into that life changing. Yeah. I'm like brain, stop it, brain. I say <laughs> that every day. Stop now. it, brain. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm much more peaceful as a result. Oh yeah. So, okay. Well, that's, that's a good, what a good icebreaker. <laughs> okay, we're, we're both well, that's great. Uh, let's, let's, for those who Don't do go not, that far. Yeah. <laughs> We were talking about just before the podcast started that it's like the House of Targaryen is meeting the Wicked Witch of the West for this interview. I love wow. it. Thank you. you. Yeah. Well, you. Uh, we're getting a Wicked, you know, yeah. live action. It I'm is. so excited. I know. That does look yeah. very good. Yeah. But she was um, always an isle of mine. Yeah. You know, I've always looked up to her. Just a woman with a mission. Yeah. Women with a mission have always inspired me. Ursula, Wicked Witch. Yeah. You know, just I have a goal. I have a task I need to achieve and I'm going to make it happen. So for those, for those that might not know Ariel mm -hmm. and the story of this strong, this strong woman, this fearless leader, um, tell us a little bit about your, your, your background. What led you into becoming the Ariel Demur that so many of us know and love today? I was always a bitch. <laughs> uh, from a very, very young age, I was always a really angry person. And, um, I, we still aren't sure why, but for some reason at a really young age, I was really, really mean and I was really, really angry. And, you know, we have some theories. My aunt's pretty adamant that I always knew I was trans. I didn't have the words to describe it, mm -hmm. but, um, as years went by and, you know, more knowledge was imparted on me and my family as to what mental illness looks like and how to break that down. I sort of learned how to channel that. And art was a huge outlet for me. My entire family just assumed that would be how I would do something. My grandma at a very young age was like, oh, you'll be fine. You're going to be famous, you know, and I still don't consider myself anything to the effect, but um, I've always been an artist in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And something that I really strived at was realizing as an artist, as a creative, you have to have multiple outlets in order to channel that creative energy so you don't get burnt out. And that's sort of one of my strong suits in what I do is that I have a lot of different pots that I have my hands in. Mm -hmm. And um, I've channeled a lot of that creative energy and that anger that I feel into make, being the change in the world that I want to see. Um, a lot of people, especially years ago would call me bitter a mm -hmm. lot. That was a word that got thrown around and I have no qualms with that. I think bitterness can be a motivational tool used to make the world a better place. I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of bullshit going on and I have no problem with being a loud sort of, um, Kurt, uh, blunt individual who will take the um, licks, you know, as life hands them because that's my lot in life. Mm -hmm. From a young age, I was always going to be an asshole. And if you want me to be one, then that's fine. Yeah. You so know? when you say you were born angry, like, like, because, because. That type that that type of emotion can manifest in different ways, right? Oh, yeah. So the little Ariel that I would have met on the playground was it was it like a she was drawing, yeah, ra oh, yeah. like a, like a rage, like a determination, a, yeah. like I'm going to show you, like kind of a competitiveness. Was it that anger, or was it more like the? It was more like a frustration. frustration. Yeah, it was a frustration. It was um, a displacement of energy, and that's something that in my adulthood I've learned uh, to really be cognizant of is. Is this energy we're feeling right now something that is rooted in reality or is this something neurochemical? Yeah. 
And uh, I would definitely say that at a young age, it was more so just, uh, you know, my mom would tell me we were sitting at a stoplight and it would be there. Like we'd be in one place for too long and I'd get pissed. Yeah. You know, it's just simple things like that. And this has carried over into my life now. If there's an issue, I'm going to do everything within my power to change it. Yeah. You know, except the things that you cannot change and have the power to change what you can. I don't remember how it goes. I'm not an alcoholic, I don't think. (laughs) But um, it's, uh, it's important to not just accept the the struggles that we have as you know okay life sucks and then you die Mm -hmm. you can do something there are changes that can be made and you know some people are much kinder and softer about it and Mm -hmm. that just never worked for me so yeah but it's like there's 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 resentment and Mm -hmm. feeling frustrated and then there's doing something about it and so you know i think maybe one thing that you and i share in our backgrounds is i i always had i I wouldn't say i necessarily grew up with with that feeling of frustration but i grew up with always having something to prove Mm. and so in a way that's kind of an aggression right like i was you know, like I, if I was going to play sports, I'd had to be the captain of the team. If I was going to be in the play, I had to be the lead of the play. You know, it was always, um, a question of channeling that energy into proving myself or proving a point. And so people used to always call me a little activist growing up. And when I think about it, when I think about shit that I did when I was younger, some of it's like wild. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah, I choose not to acknowledge some of the stuff that <laughs> happened in my past because it will make me question how the hell am I still alive? But the fuck you factor is one of the best motivational ways to get shit yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. You say I can't do it. You think I'm not capable. You think I don't possess the, you know, mental fortitude. Fuck you, I did it. Yeah, yeah. And that that's like that energy that makes you want to sort of show them up for. Uh-huh. Yeah, so you were a little activist as well. In my own way. Yeah. Yeah, For sure. Never got to be president of the, uh, what was it called? Gay Straight Alliance? The GSA. Yeah. Jazz. The jazz. Whatever. (laughs) That guy. But uh, yeah. 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 Well, it's it's interesting. Like, I I know you mentioned that growing up, you know, you looking back, you always, you always, you can see how you always felt trans in your identity, but just didn't have the words to to put it together. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, similarly, I, I grew up always knowing I was queer, that definition of what that meant evolved over time. Um, but you know, in any case, growing up, knowing that there was a, there was sort of an othering amongst you and your peers that you did have to, you know, stand up and, and, and so how did you find, you know, I guess your journey towards your transition, maybe walk us through a little bit about that. Cause I think that would be really important to share with those tuning in that Mm -hmm. are going through it or have questions about what it feels like for sure for each each person's individual journey yeah um so it was really kind i had a different experience than most i find especially growing up in south florida where there is a really strong presence mm-hmm. of uh trans and queer people i do find the way i describe it and this isn't going to sound very nice but um i feel like a lot of floridian culture is sort of just delayed We're always kind of like 20 years behind, 30 years behind sometimes. And um, I always knew there was something up. You know, my first inclination, like, oh, you like dudes, was like maybe like six years old. Mm -hmm. I noticed that my sister's best friend's older brother looked just like Harvey from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And I said, I'm going to marry him. Yeah. That's that's my one. Yeah, it was just an automatic. Yeah, just sort of instinctive. And once again, I'm very fortunate. I had a lovely childhood. Yeah. Nothing unsavory happened. Um, but I always knew that that was something as I got older, I was fortunate enough to, and I describe it as fortunate enough, but I was lucky enough to learn about this gay strip club that hired exclusively twinks, Mm -hmm. petite, young, feminine looking gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that place really opened my eyes to so much of the world. And I was able to explore my sexuality. I've always had an attraction to a balance of masculine and feminine. And that was something that I struggled with because all of my friends were feminine, you know, a lot of them were trans. We all transitioned around the same time. We sort of were like the first big group of uh, gay boys to uh, beautiful women. And a lot of little gay boys followed suit after the fact. Uh, But 
I kind of was never able to really explore that side of myself in South Florida because it was not encouraged by any means. Yeah. Uh, it was almost something I had to not hide, but just not highlight with my friendships because mm-hmm. it would become sort of like a, like, ew, don't yuck my yum. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So um, I didn't really hook up with a lot of people who fit the bill of what I liked because it wasn't what I was easily able to access in that yeah. culture. You know, I wasn't into straight dudes. I didn't mm-hmm. want like big beefy men, you know, sweating all over me. I thought it was gross, but you know, you, you make compromises, especially when you've got a lot of testosterone in your body and you got to get it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I moved to Los Angeles. It's when I learned about the uh, alphabet community. Yeah. And I was finally able to extrapolate on like, oh, okay, you like this and you like this and you like this. Maybe that means this could be your thing. And this label might speak towards you and so on. And that's when I never really came out for anything. Mm-hmm. I never came out as gay. I never came out as trans. I never came out as non-binary or anything. It just sort of was. I just existed. And if someone wanted me to label myself, I'm like, okay, fine. Yeah. I don't need that, though. I'm just doing my thing. So my transition especially really happened gradually. And it just was. Mm-hmm. You know, I realized at a certain point, okay, I think hormones are going to be the the right trajectory. I don't really have the words to describe how I feel. Once again, I've always been very self-reliant. So I do highly recommend if you feel like you might be a member of the trans community, talk to a gender therapist, yeah. talk to a psychiatrist, talk to doctors. Um, unfortunately, we're at a weird time in our American history where that is becoming less and less accessible, depending on where you live. But I'm optimistic. And... Uh, For me, I made the right choice. And, you know, I saw so many benefits by just slowly dipping my toes in and just asking questions and figuring out, okay, I don't need a label. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be broken down into a little category, but I do need answers. Yeah. And that's been really, really life changing for me. When I first started in the adult entertainment industry, I was still identifying as non binary because the very binary trans women I grew up with in South Florida were like, we like straight men and we are women. Yep. And that is it. Yep. And of course, they're not all like that, but But the ones I was around were like that. And still are and are very frustrating, but there's, it, there's more layers to it. Yeah. And, and it's great to be able to live in a time where we're able to really just exist and we don't have to put a label on it, especially it, yeah. because if you're going to weaponize my label, then I don't fucking care. Call yeah. me a dude. I don't care. Yeah. That has nothing to do with me. I wake up and I see someone who is so stunning <laughs> and, and I, is, get to, I, agree with that. I get to enjoy that and yeah. revel in it and yeah. relish it 
that your opinion of me is going to have zero effect on how I'm going to exist. Yeah. Because I'm going to find a way. You know, it, the, your story really speaks to me because I feel like in many ways, um, my own experience was different, but a similar path. So I grew up with a ton of gendered sort of confusion and dysmorphia, mm, right? Okay. Where I, you know, I knew I was, I knew I liked girls from an early age, but the girls that I liked were the girls that I saw being kind of modeled on 90210 and Saved by the Bell. And they, okay. I wanted to take the cheerleader to the prom. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the limited amount of exposure that I had to, you know, gay and lesbian people at the time was mm -hmm. very stereotyped. Uh, you know, oh, very yeah. like, you know, mask identifying, you know, buzz cut, That's combat so boots. And that wasn't who I saw myself with. And I also was always, you know, a tomboy or however you uh -huh. would describe it and definitely felt more comfortable in that skin. So all of my adolescence and even into my early 20s, I, I remember in the mid 90s looking up, you know, gender reassignment surgery on mm -hmm. dial up internet, you know, <laughs> whatever it, what it would have been labeled as at that God, time, hope no yeah, one sex, calls. sex changes, right. <laughs> yeah. And kind of, and binding my breasts for a period of time. Uh -huh. And like, you know, really, you know, trying to see if that was my path. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I felt a lot of, you know, a lot of confusion about like kind of just existing in a purgatory where like, I am who I am. I know who I like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't feel, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to label myself especially at that time as, you know, as anything, I don't think I ever really came out either. Everyone just yeah. knew I was gay. Yeah. Um, but, you but it was, eyes. yeah. But when I, I remember I moved to a big city, I kind of grew up in a mid-sized, pretty homogenous conservative town. Mm -hmm. And I moved to a big city and met for the first time a group of uh, lesbians. Mm -hmm. And I had always been the gay girl with the straight friends growing up. So like I could count on one hand, the number of Gay, queer friends I had. Sure. So when I met this uh, group of lesbians, it was like, oh my gosh, there's one with long hair. Ah! Oh my gosh, there's <laughs> one that wears makeup, you know? And like, they were all French. So none of them really spoke English, but they all, but it, it was an eclectic mix. And that, it was at that point, right? Where I, where I was able to like, kind of just broaden my horizons mm -hmm. and meet a group, like a diverse group of queer identifying women that I started to feel like, oh, okay, so maybe there is a fit for me just as me. And, you know, over time, now I look back and I really think a lot, especially with, you know, um, you know, the, the trans rights movement of the last decade and having so many, you know, friends and, and, and peers within, you know, our industry who are mm -hmm. trans identifying and really, really reflecting on my journey towards, towards, you know, that and, and, and coming you know, into being comfortable with my gender identity. And I, I really resonate with that fact that it was the exposure for me that helped me realize where my fit was. For sure. And so, yeah. So yeah, representation yeah, matters. It knew? sure does. Right. Who'd have thought? Who would have thought? So you, so you, you, you came to LA, mm -hmm. you started to, you know, you started to realize where your path was going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, you had already done, as you mentioned, uh, um, sex work in the form of, you know, um, uh, working in clubs and stuff. Adult films. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. So I was very fortunate in that I loved escorting. Mm -hmm. I loved in-person sex work. It really filled my tank for a few different reasons. Uh, and during the pandemic, I had a rule and I won't say that I think this is a hundred percent the most ethical concept, but I preferred to only see married men during the pandemic because I felt that they had more to lose and single men were going to be a little bit more risky. They weren't going, they don't have families that they have to be responsible for. Mm -hmm. So I had a very select few amount of people that I was uh, in their bubble Maybe their whole family didn't know that their bubble included me. Mm -hmm. But I I was fortunate enough to be very judicious over who I saw. And there were a lot of really awesome, awesome, awesome people that I stayed in touch with for quite a long time. But because of this line of work, I've not been able to do in-person stuff mm -hmm. as much as I would have liked. But I met a lot of really educated and worldly individuals who really helped shape what do you see for yourself for the rest of your life? Because I've always my entire life looked up to, you know, these um, 
that that madam type, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, that archetype has always spoken to me. And I realized I definitely know where I see myself in 20 years. I know exactly what that looks like. Mm-hmm. And that's not up for debate. But I had to figure out how am I going to get there? Mm-hmm. And so I filled in the middle with why not porn? You like sex work. You like um you putting on a show. Yeah. I did drag for years and that was so much fun and so important to me. And I wish more queer people, I wish more trans women, I wish more, uh, you know, people who've never been to a drag show would just go out and not just watch that one TV show. Right. That reality program. Or and God forbid reading in schools or the brunch, the brunch. Whatever, yeah. you know, and, um, and see them because historically – Trans women always started as drag queens. And and I'm finding a huge breakdown between Gen Z and their perception of trans women and drag. And it's mm-hmm. so crazy because they always existed hand in hand culturally for decades and decades and decades. And they, it's so strange to some people to see a trans woman who identifies as a drag queen as well. Right. You know, the word trans wasn't even really used 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. They refer to themselves in all different kinds of ways. I realized that in order to do that, porn would be an awesome way to meet the people I need to meet, get a lot of hands-on knowledge, doing a lot of different things. And once again, it's diversifying my creativity. I'm able to pour myself into new frontiers that I didn't even know existed and find that not only is this, you know, a career that can pay my bills, but it fortifies me Mm -hmm. and it gives me so much more room to grow as an artist and to express myself. And it's opened my mind so much that I I'm so grateful that it exists. God willing, it still exists in a handful of years, (laughs) cross your fingers. But I, I, had a hunch. It took me a long time to decide if it was going to be the right move for me because I wasn't sure people were going to take me seriously if they knew what I looked like naked. And uh, I think it was definitely one of the best decisions I've made, hands down. You know, um, I'm not for everybody, but I'm certainly for a good handful of people. Yeah. And, and they let me know. So well, I, I remember the first time, I distinctly remember the first time that uh, you ever came in and worked with us. And everybody was just so blown away by how professional you were, what a great performer you were, how oh. just like fun you were on set. That was with Christy. It I'm was, yes, again. yes. Yeah. It was like, you know, and I think it was something like a last minute cancellation. So we needed somebody the That's day me. of. And I'm always a last minute fill in for the most part. And I am grateful for it because it just goes to show I can be on time. Well, it's, it's, there's, there's something, you know, as, as a producer, there are a handful of people that you know you can count on mm-hmm. when the shit hits the fan. And those are amongst the most valuable relationships. So sure. being able to develop the relationship or being able to develop the reputation of being someone you can call in a pinch who, you know, is is tested, is able to get in, is going to make the day great, are like, you're like a lifeline in in the in the sh- rocky seas that are <laughs> that is poor, and poor. It is a tumultuous sea. <laughs> it is a tumultuous industry. sea. No, but yes. I I remember that scene, and I remember you know that was the first of like so many you know projects we've worked on together uh, at Adult Time. I'd love to hear like what are some of your highlights uh, from your Adult Time reel? Like if you can think of one or two projects. Oh, that I've got a couple. You. I was so so ironically. I think it was that scene. It was either that scene or it was neighborly greetings (laughs) with Kenna James and um, Aiden, Ashley, and then my good Judy, my my Jade Venus, uh, that the director, Stella Smut, had... I had green nails at the time and she had made a comment about them. I'm like, yeah, I love Sally Bowles. I love cabaret. You know, it's sort of my signature color. She's like, oh, I've always wanted to do a scene where it's sort of like a gender reversal of cabaret. Mm -hmm. And then uh, their partner at the time, Brooklyn Gray, had an original song. And so being able to have that synergy and create a character because I based my character on a very 
influential trans woman. Her name was International Crisis. She was an enigma. She was so fascinating. She was so stunning. Mm -hmm. And um, she kind of shaped how I wanted to portray that role. And I got to wear, you know, my own vintage clothes and I got to bring so much into it. And the, the day that was the longest day I've ever been on a set. Uh, it was so the longest yeah. day that I think I've been on set in, yeah. in the last, I, I've had my time, but the, oh, in yeah. the last handful of years, yeah, I would agree. That was a big day. And to have so many different moving parts to it that came together and created such a beautiful piece that I still get to look back on and be so proud of. I'm here for the auditions. You're late. Are you Ariel Demure? It's <sighs> Madame Demure. Thank you. Why do you think that you are capable of being an MC? An MC? <laughs> this is my legacy. I did this. No one gave it to me. No one let me have it. I made this. Well, if you're gonna fucking MC, I gotta take a look at you in the light. Come. I'm Brooklyn Blind. I. I'm very grateful to that. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't done anything to my knowledge that has stretched me quite as much as that role because that was mostly improv. There were points that I had to hit, but it was very high energy and it was a lot of passion and it was a lot of drawing out from inspiration from different places. But that scene means a lot to me. And I, I relish the day. I look forward to the day when I get to do something similar again. Because yeah. even International Crisis herself, I really implore people to look her up. She's so incredible. She was a muse to Salvador Dali. She um, was uh, so central to the uh, queer community in the New York nightlife. Um, so fabulous. Lost way too young. Uh I would love to like bring her story, yeah, you know, yeah. to to light and talk about her. Or there's so many different projects I have in mind that I'm planning on doing. Well, I remember that day. I, I'm pretty sure that episode. I want to say it was called "Under Her Wing." I think yes, yes. correct uh, on Transfixed, and that definitely was a real passion project, as you mentioned from mm -hmm. from everybody involved yeah. in it. And I, for me, that's one of the things I love the most about our kind of way that we work and what we're, how we're so fortunate to work where you just riff off of ideas. Yeah. You know, you can be on set together, someone can say something and then it's like, oh, you can do that or, oh, that's a good idea. And then that sparks what happens next. 100%. And I know that with um, the experience of making uh, Under Her Wing, that that was for me the catalyst towards asking you to be one of our muses, which led to so much more. Yes, but like, yes, the muses project was such a fucking amazing concept, mm -hmm. and I'm so freaking grateful that I got to be a part of that. That was insane. The second I learned about it, I was like, "What am I gonna get my <laughs> Oh my god, if I don't get to be a muse!" And I did. And um, the one of the first concepts I had messaged you about yes. was the gentleman for blondes idea, and. Um, I wanted to work with Kenzie Ann and I was like, okay, so that's a reach. Let's have a nice long list of people that we can work with. And, uh, almost the same day, I think you said, oh no, we've got her. Yeah. You know, and I pff, didn't see that coming. And, um, I was really adamant because I was a makeup artist for nine years before porn that I really wanted to, and I have a huge passion for, uh, classic Hollywood cinema I wanted to do the makeup. I wanted to do the hair. I wanted to do the styling. I wanted to mm -hmm. be involved in every aspect of it. And then we even choreographed the whole dance number the day of. And it, it, there was so much like just different ways that we were being creative, you know, like little engines. Mm -hmm. It was 
it's another amazing, amazing project yeah. that I'm so grateful I got to be a part of. Yeah. You know? Well, and as you can, as as the audience can probably tell from those who are watching this and, and the way you are styled versus the way that I am styled, I was very grateful <laughs> that you were, that you were willing to come in and style that shoot because it was like flawless. It was, it was gentlemen prefer blondes. It was right. an amazing homage to that. And, and Kenzie Ann was the perfect choice. And I know she was, she was just, uh, super excited too, to have that, that the look. world to me yeah. too. She had long hair, like right up before the scene. So I was like figuring out ways that I was going to make it work so we could get the perfect styling. And then she cut her freaking hair. Yeah. Like days before the scene. And I'm like, you star, you're a star. I love you. And that was one of those scenes where, because my experience on set has changed greatly mm -hmm. over time, like learning how different performers have to be present. Yeah. That was one of those scenes where I was like, oh, this is real. Like we really enjoyed creating that scene. And it read on camera, like from the time that we said action to the time that the scene finished, we really didn't stop, you know, sort of uh, enjoying each other's company mm -hmm. uh, because we just wanted to. And it was yeah. just fun. And we were able to just be ourselves and be authentic and be so transparent and like have a real interaction, a human interaction. And I think that really reads in that scene mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I, I love what I do and I'm grateful to be able to do it, but every scene is unique. And the way that we go about um, making sure everyone is comfortable at adult time that we do porn differently, mm -hmm. that is a bespoke experience for each individual scene. Yeah. And that one was so like just affirming. It was so great to yeah. be a part of that. Well, and the, the, um, you know, you mentioned that your experience in the industry has really like opened your eyes up to all these different creative outlets. Certainly that was an example, I think of your stamp on coming to the table as a collaborator creatively. Mm -hmm. And since then you've done some pretty amazing stuff. I, we have to plug the Gorgon. So please tell Thank everybody. You. About oh, I'm so glad that we get to, because, uh, Drum roll, we are finally releasing the uh, narrative portion of Gorgons and Goddesses. It was a feature that we worked on the production company that I was partnered with at the time. And I'm so grateful to them that we were able to make such a big endeavor possible. But Gorgons and Goddesses was a project that had kind of been brewing in my mind because my good friends, Jade Venus and Tori Easton, um, we were joking around one day and uh, there's this common terminology that gets thrown around with trans women is like, oh, they're the dolls. Mm -hmm. We're the dolls. And I'm like, I don't play with dolls. I never liked dolls. If they're the dolls, we're the gorgons. That's why that's why yeah. we didn't cast you in the movie Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we cast you in office misconduct. <laughs> and oh, that was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for letting me be the Lucy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was um, sort of like, oh, that actually is a funny concept. Like, what if we were Gorgons? What mm -hmm. if I did something for Gorgons? And then I was very inspired by the Muses Project. And uh, you had gotten together such an insane cast that I was like, what if we created a analogy for how the studio system has sort of shaped us as creatives and where it's going? Mm -hmm. So that's what the narrative portion of the film is about. It's um, exploring how there is a new tide of individuals, men and women, who have realized that the antiquated ways that we have been indoctrinated with, that we must do things a certain way and because that is how it has always been done. Mm -hmm. We have the autonomy. You know, one cannot survive without the other. However, we can survive without some mm -hmm. aspects of the old ways. And uh, it's... It's a beautiful metaphor. It, it's a beautiful scene. I've never seen 11 trans women come together and create an orgy that was that fucking insane. It was so good. It, we never cut either, which was amazing. Um, Michael Vegas did a, like, words don't describe how beautiful and uh, pup, our 
cinematographer, our co, our second camera for the day, the, the things that we were able to accomplish, I, I'm still so like awestruck mm -hmm. by the, the, the magnitude of how beautiful that all came together. And, um, once again, I'm not an overachiever, but I am an artist and I like to, you know, express myself in many ways. So I made the costumes. I worked together with my, uh, co-writer T.S. Mary Jane to create the dialogue. We worked with, uh, Natasha and Amarada for the photography. We worked with Kelly Holland at her beautiful animal rescue to mm -hmm. like really sell this sort of ethereal essence and, um, there was just so much working together to create that really elaborate and beautiful story that not only was visually captivating and told a story that was really interesting, but was hot. Yeah. You know, it was crazy. It like was you Bacchanalia, said, 11, you know? 11 trans women in an orgy. Has the, it ever even yeah. been done before? And the only thing I regret is that I didn't get to invite more people to it because I know they would have been so perfect in it. The fact that like Gracie Jane and Zariah Ora weren't a part of it or like Lola Moreno, who I think I had mm -hmm. asked, Amanda Riley, who I think uh, we were going to ask, but then we were already at nine and I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. We also had a three special guests that no one has seen mm -hmm. that were a part of that project because the narrative hasn't premiered yet, but that will be coming out very, very shortly. We got to make the AVN cutoff. <laughs> yeah. So our, August. that was going to be one of my questions to you, because I know one of the challenges with creator led projects these days is that, you know, OnlyFans isn't recognized as a right a platform, for which is unfortunate, yeah. but you know, it, it is what it is. We've just got to stay the course yeah. and keep on keeping on. So we are working with, um, adult empire yeah. to release that scene, uh, very, very shortly. There's been a few bumps in the road, some legal things that we've had to work through that unfortunately took a lot longer than I would have anticipated, but you know, the best way to learn is by making mistakes. Oh yeah. So I made a lot and <laughs> <laughs> boy, am I learning. And, um, yeah, so that's all happening. It's coming out very shortly and I'm elated because there's some other fun little things that are going to be Gorgons mm -hmm. and Goddesses related. Oh, nice. Also can you, can you give bike. us like a little, a little tease, just like a tiny tease? So once again, you know, I'm a bit of a pretentious asshole. Uh, I wanted to tell the story of how Medusa became Medusa. It's a very uh, unsavory concept that was adopted by the women's liberation movement in the 70s. And I really liked the retelling that they sort of utilized in order to reframe this graphic, horrible thing that happened to a woman that did absolutely nothing wrong and sort of tell the story of instead of Athena punishing Medusa for being assaulted, she gives her the power to never be assaulted again. Mm -hmm. And that sort of like reframing just like, brain blasted for me. And so I have a couple people signed on mm -hmm. to be a part of my little project and that we're going in a much different direction creatively. It's going to be a little bit more, um, it's basically going to be the opposite of what Gorgons and Goddesses was. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give away too much, but we are going to be really digging deep into some uh, really beautiful and cathartic themes, mm -hmm. I think. So I'm very excited to see where that goes. Amazing. Well, I can't wait. I, 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 I love seeing your kind of creative mind just taking its steps. I'll let you know off let, camera. Yeah. You let me know. Yeah. You give me all, you give me all the off camera. I have to tell you a funny, funny, anecdote about Medusa as it relates to my, my upbringing. So we, uh, we were big fans of the, uh, you know, Clash of the Titans film. Love. Yeah. When I was growing up, except my younger sister was terrified of the stop action animation Medusa. I was going to say that creepy little owl. Yeah. Well, not the owl. Well, I, I like, the owl was cute. The owl was cute. But the, but, but, but the stop. Uncanny yeah. Valley. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes me anxious. But she was terrified of Medusa. And so my brother and I would regularly, if we, you know, we're just being mean, would lock her in the basement and just scream Medusa, Medusa <laughs> over and over again. 
<laughs> so yeah. I, I always think of that whenever I think of Medusa. So mm -hmm. um, I will replace that memory with the memory of your project oh, when I watch it. Grateful I am. Um, so what are your favorite types of scenes to shoot nowadays when you are working, you know, uh, for companies? Sure. I did one with uh, Jim Powers not too long ago. He's a He's a buddy at this yep. point. He's uh, he's someone I look up to. Yeah, another I, adult time director. Yeah. So I, I every time I get to work with him, I'm like, thank God, you know, because it's just going to be a fun day. Mm -hmm. um, but I did a scene with him, I think, uh, writing that wave of uh, 11 trans women on camera. Somebody might have gotten inspired. And we did a huge, I think it was 10 people orgy that was... Uh, all trans women, cis men, and then cherry kiss. <laughs> a little cherry on top. This wasn't, was uh, this a Gilligan's Island pair? No, no this, was this one hasn't come out yet. Okay, We're very okay. excited for it. But that was a really great day. And I've posted about it on social media, so I don't, I don't care about saying it. But um, that one's going to be great. Awesome. That one was an insane day. Because when with big things like that, there's a lot of preparation that you have to know already goes into it. So by the time the camera is finally rolling, you're literally like white knuckling it. Like, yeah. I need to get my clothes off immediately. Let's make this shit happen. Because you just want to be in it. Yeah. You know, you want to get down and have a good time. Because yeah. at the end of the day, what we do is for profit. We're not actually in love with one another. We're not actually getting married after. However... There is still that human element where you have the capability to derive pleasure from mm. what you're doing, yeah. you know, and uh, when it is a fun day and a fun cast and people that you actually have uh, rapport with, it makes for really compelling content. Yeah. And that one I'm really excited about coming out. The Gilligan's Island ones were hilarious. Those were just uh, goofy. Yeah, those yeah. Were, those were silly, silly times. And then um, I did a camping scene not too long ago with Cliff Jensen. I love getting to work with Cliff because he's one of the few people, especially male talent, who just enjoys their job, wants to show up, wants to have a good time, wants to make good content. He's been mm -hmm. doing it for, I think, over 10 years now. And... Um, we have just like a, a good on camera bond mm -hmm. and on set bond. And we're able to like really make great scenes together. Yeah. So I'm always grateful when uh, I can watch a scene back and be like, damn, that was nice. Yeah. That was, that was a good time. Do you, <laughs> do you often watch your scenes? Not often. Me and the girls do viewing parties every now and again, especially when we're really proud of them. We sat together and watched Office Misconduct and, you know, no harm. No foul, but uh, uh, Jade's acting in that scene was fucking stellar. I really thought that that one. I'm so glad that it won movie. Yeah, it won. So I think it things. swept and all. It, all yeah, the it deserved words, it. Yeah. It was Dalltime's first trans yep. feature, if I'm yep. not mistaken, and uh, it deserved all the accolades it received. But uh, Jade's performance was beyond. And I still, to this day, think she is one of the, if not the most talented adult performer I've mm -hmm. ever seen. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that she is able to be so feminine and so elegant and still throw a girl around, throw a guy around yeah. is insane she has so they're called transitions that's what something that jim power really stressed to me is that we need more male talent that have solid transitions can go from one position to another seamlessly on camera mm -hmm. the way that girl just like a snake will just undulate around and get the angle and get the camera beyond yeah. beyond what that woman is capable of doing and yeah. you know and to do it all with a with a megaphone with a damn megaphone <laughs> <laughs> she was yeah. on a table with literally a coliseum of people just cheering her on. Oh, yeah. 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 Looks good. All right, bitches, round up. We are having a mandatory meeting in the conference room now. Do you ladies know why I brought you into this meeting today? Who are you? I'm the new intern. Intern? I don't talk to interns. There is some serious misconduct happening at this company. Misconduct? Pretty big claim. Go on. She told me that you have all been having sexual relations in the office. Is that right? You know how I feel about sexual relations in the office. Always 
include me. What? You should be. Line up, ladies. You want those Christmas bonuses, don't you? This is the culture of my company. Are you in or are you out? And that was such that was such a fun shoot. That that to me is really one of the highlight shoots uh, of my career because it was like three days. Yes. We we had we had dressed the whole studio we were at, so we were just like kind of like in the living set. It was such a good cast. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first movies I made with with Michael Vegas and Susie and their crew. Um, and it was just, you know, it wasn't a, co we, we did it improv style the way I always really do. One of your first scenes. One of, with it Michael was one of my Susie. first movies okay. with them. We'd been working together. I mean, I've worked with Michael as an actor for a long time, but mm -hmm. like we'd been working together, um, behind the camera for maybe like a year to two years before that. Wow. But that was one of the first bigger projects. Wow. And it was just, you know, it they was, it, well, it was chemistry that everybody yeah. had chemistry, you know, and it was just a, such a good time that I think that good energy that we all felt making it mm -hmm. just translated into For the sure. Final. It was yeah. the first time I'd worked because there is, it's a very political industry that we're in. That was the first time I'd worked with a lot of like big name cis female performers mm -hmm. and the treatment that we got on set, the way everyone was just there and having a great time. And yes, we were working, we were being professional, but the fact that we were all treated as equals and we had so much fun mm -hmm. was crazy. And we got so much accomplished and it was so timely and efficient. And it, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. Susie's a super person. Yeah. She's a super woman, you know, like the, the way that she can just make things happen. Uh, they're, the dynamic duo, as far as I'm concerned, it's, yeah. it's craziness. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, it was for me, it's definitely one of the, the, when I think, when I think of our work together, uh, highlights, you know, just that project was, and, and like it swept. So there you go. Good work. It's a sign. It's a sign. Something coming up. I know yeah. you said you want to do more dramatic acting. You, you did, you it. did inspire me as well. I remember on, maybe it was when we were shooting under her wing, we were talking about you know, the industry and, and, uh, at the time transfixed was sort of limited as a series, mm -hmm. uh, all girl series with, uh, trans and yes. cis females together. And I remember, you know, we were having a conversation about that and you saying in, in a, in a very like gentle, right. like nice suggestive way, but it would be great to extend this kind of treatment and quality to scenes with you know, cis guys as well. And to scenes with trans guys as well. And trans I, on yeah. And within, you know, within a, a number of months of that, we, we green lit regular, we have our lesbian episodes of Transfix, mm -hmm. We have our straight episodes of Transfix, and we've, you know, had, uh, some trans guys and some mm -hmm. scenes as well. So, so thank you for also, you know, again, one thing sparks the idea of another, but I remember that conversation was a good catalyst for me for, well, you know, so going grateful. to my team and, and expanding it. So, hey, amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw that it was happening and I know with everything, there's growing pains. And, you know, some people were kind of confused, like transfixed is lesbian. Ah. And, and I love doing I, it's my majority of the scenes that I do are lesbian. I find that I have the best synergy with cis female performers a lot of the time and trans women uh, performers. It just it sort of flows very seamlessly um, because we have like a shared understanding of like how a scene works. Uh, nothing against male performers. We do need better ones. We have a handful of very talented ones, but um, unfortunately because of the, the political nature of our industry, it is very telling to see how many men end up in our DMs and how many performers show very transparent interest in certain you know safe circles that would never be caught actually doing a scene mm -hmm. with a trans woman. And I think that's fortunately, eventually, you know, it's all a pendulum, yeah. you know, culture is always swinging back and forth. I, I look forward to the day when people can uh, tuck the tail from between their legs and actually be like a Cliff Jensen and say, Hey, I, am primarily interested in cis women off camera. I primarily work with men on camera. I would like to work with trans women. Mm -hmm. And he campaigned for himself. And um, 
you know, I have a lot of respect for people who are able to do that. And uh, something that I've mentioned in the past, I understand that people are entitled to make mistakes. And what I love about this industry so much is the grace that's afforded people who can come out and say, I made a mistake. I've said things that I have remorse over. Mm -hmm. And not only do we forgive them, we move right past it because at the end of the day, this is a business and we want to make money. We mm -hmm. want to make art, but we want to make money too. And we don't have to agree on everything. Yeah. We can be in ethical disagreement on a whole litany of topics and still make art because that is something that's so unique to the culture of adult entertainment. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. I mean, the amount of freaking very conservative individuals that I would meet in the clubs that, you know, if they were to see me on the street, they would not be very receptive to my existence. But once you get them behind closed doors, you know, those walls really come down mm -hmm. and we're able to really meet somewhere in the middle in those, in those instances. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, planting seeds, it, it goes a long way. Well, and to go back to the start of our conversation, right? Like sometimes it's a case of just, um, providing, providing the the community and the space mm -hmm. and allowing people to get to that point where yeah. you know they discover and i think i think you know in in, in my years within this industry I, I think the big one of the biggest lessons i've learned is the best thing we can do is create that space mm -hmm. And then those who, who those who want to come will ultimately come, even if it takes them a while to get there. Hell you know, yeah. I mean, that was sort of the spirit of Transfixed in the first place. Yeah. Was rather than making this a statement, let's just make it a beautiful series. Yeah. And, you know, it may, you know, you may have, you just, you just need enough of the, you know, the snowball to start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now of all the series we produce, it's the one that probably has the longest waiting list of people that want to work for it because oh, yeah. it's, because it has a reputation for just being beautiful and, you know, and, and, um, and it's not about, you know, we really try to just make it about, you know, the stories themselves and the characters and, and like I said, the lesbian stories, the straight stories and, yeah. and the in-between stories. So I love it. That's yeah. so, that's so wonderful to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So we've had a lovely conversation. Mm -hmm. We're going to wrap it up with what I like to call rapid fire. Let me have it. Top or bottom? First pish. Oh my goodness. Don't limit yourself. My goodness. You're my favorite, by the way, for rapid fire, because oh I remember we were doing this at, I think it was the convention last year. Anyway, I'm excited for your answers. Okay. So does size matter? Yeah. Smaller, the better. <laughs> Unless we're talking ass, in which case the bigger, the better. Good to know. Um, what's one, what's one sex act that you have tried, but you're not going to try it again? I once punched someone in their ass and felt their like lower colon. Mm -hmm. I had a guy who not only did he want to get fisted, he wanted me to punch him. I think I've had enough of that. Mm -hmm. That was plenty. A one and done, as they yes. say. Yes. <laughs> so what's your definition of amazing sex? Uh, remembering it. <laughs> just like being in it and then it just being so good that you can remember it and use that for future encounters. Like when it counts, making yeah. sex count. If you could have any celebrity slide in your DMs who maybe has or hasn't already, who would it be? Alive or dead. Oh, okay. Well, I would like to do both. Okay. I would like both. Uh, let's go ahead and say Christopher Maloney. Okay. I'm still waiting for you very patiently. And uh, dead Paul Newman, 100%. Easy. Cool hand, Luke. All right. My last question for you is going to be, what, if any, are your pre-scene rituals? I redact my previous statement. Uh, Cholula Bankhead. That would be, it, live or dead, she knows how to have fun. That would be an experience like no other. Okay, I'm gonna add, okay before <laughs> okay okay I'm gonna add one more question then before we talk about rituals. Um, okay, so we've we've done living, we've done dead. Now I have to have like um, literary or film or uh, pop culture character. Uh, oh, so person that doesn't exist. Yes. <laughs> oh God. Uh, let's see. Sadie Hawkins. No, that's not her name. Sadie. Sadie. Her name's Sadie. 
Rain, Joan Crawford's character in Rain. I was waiting for a Joan Crawford reference in this oh, interview, and now I got goat. it. I mean, uh, how do you know? Of course. There you go. Tallul- I got to tell you the story about right. Tallulah Bankett and Joan yeah. Crawford later. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. We'll have a dedicated podcast just about that, where you fill me in on all the backstories. All the great lesbian Hollywood sexcapades. Yes, fantastic, so fantastic. Uh, if you, um, so yeah, pre-sex or pre-scene rituals. Uh, I wake up, God, uh, typically like four hours before I have to leave for call time. And uh, I just like to really take my time to get ready. I like to wake up. I like to get my energy going. If I'm going to be doing a scene like today, you have to stretch, get the blood flowing. That's my big sex tip. Mm -hmm. You must stretch and you must get your leg, the the blood flowing. It makes your dick work better. It makes everything sort of like just more uh, flexible, you know. But um, and then I do my makeup in the car. Save time. There you you go. There you go. I have my little kit. I've been doing it long enough. Best lighting. Bing, bang, boom. Show up. Makeup ready. Excellent. Love it. All right. Please let everybody know where they can find you. Plug all the links um, because I especially want people to check out your upcoming projects. Well, okay. So I'm Ariel Demure on all platforms. I have recently just onboarded a new assistant who's going to be able to help me navigate the very complicated world of the World Wide Web. And um, we're hoping to really diversify this coming year. We're going to really be branching out and trying new things. We've got a Pornhub account up. We've got an Adult Empire account going up. We um, are even thinking of partnering with a certain company that's going to be employing a very specific service. We've got a lot of projects underway, maybe a little cabaret show that I've been brainstorming over the past few years that might be happening sooner than later. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And um, yeah, DM DM me directly. I check them. I check them. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I knew that this was going to be a really fun hour and it was. So appreciate you. Appreciate all that you do. And thank you for being, thank you for being so angry. <laughs> yeah. It's that it's my driving force. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. All right. Thanks guys. Thank you. All right. I just finished wrapping up an amazing convo with one of my favorite people in the porno community. The one, the only Ms. Ariel Demure. It was like House Targaryen meets Wicked Witch, but like any conversation I have with Ariel, it's incredible. She has such a spirit. She has such an amazing creative energy, both with her projects at Adult Time and also the work that she is putting out under her own line, including the amazing Gorgons and Goddesses, which I highly recommend you check out. If you wanna check her out, if you wanna lend some support, we've got all her links listed below. And as always, We appreciate you letting us know how you like this podcast. And you can do that by subscribing, by leaving a comment, uh, by liking this video. And as always, we appreciate you. We'll see you next week.